Yeah. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Weiss. I'm the director at the U.S. Desk in the International Relations Department at Yad Vashem. Thank you very much for joining us. Those who are joined us from the United States, Europe, Asia, Middle East, Africa, South America, all around the world. Thank you for attending this uh, lecture. We are broadcasting uh, to you from Israel, where things are slowly uh, but surely going back to their normal course. And we hope that this will be the same in all the world all over, and that we will all experience this um, normality very soon again. Today's lecture focus on what happened after uh, the dust of war settled in Europe. Uh, while the bells ring out in celebration of victory over the Axis powers, Holocaust survivors were forced to come to terms with their, with their new reality, one that consisted largely of pain and loss. My dear colleague and friend, Ephraim K., director of the International Seminars at the International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem, has been leading Holocaust education activities at Yad Vashem since 1988. He brings with him many, many decades of knowledge and experience uh, to what will surely be a memorable lecture. Uh, so thank you all, and thank you, Ephraim, and please, Ephraim. Okay, uh, good evening from Jerusalem. And I'd like to thank the entire Department of International Relations of Yad Vashem for organizing this. And I hope all of you will walk away a little bit more enriched and inspired. The presentation is called Liberation. So first I wrote here Liberation with a question mark, with a question mark. First of all, something about World War II. And I put this up here just to give you an idea of the horrific casualties, the deaths that incurred a, to almost every nation throughout Europe North Africa, a, in the European theater of operations, and the Pacific theater of operations, we're talking between 40 and 60 million people lost their lives, most were civilians. If we take the Soviet Union alone, the estimates are in between 20 and 30 million people that lost their lives. If you go down over here, you'll see uh, the United States had a little bit over 400,000 casualties but 70% of those casualties were in the European theater of operations and the rest in the Pacific theater of operations. And you can see also percentages of the, uh, of the different countries uh, that these casualties uh, uh, represent. Let's go to the next one, the Jewish population. This is the Jewish population pre-World War II. Uh, throughout Europe, it's between nine and a half and 10 million Jews are living throughout uh, the European continent, about another million Jews throughout North Africa and the Middle East. This is the Jewish population uh, before World War II. Let's see the next one. And this is important. It's estimated that between 5.8 to 6 million Jews uh, were murdered uh, during the Holocaust during World War II. And you have the different countries, the percentage of Jews in those countries uh, that were murdered. And I want to take just a moment to explain something here. Because I just said there were 40 to 60 million people that lost their lives during World War II, mostly with civilians. How do we understand this in the context of all of those people that lost their lives during World War II? When we look at these, these numbers over here, I want you to understand that during World War II, of the nine and a half to 10 million Jews in Europe, about 7 million Jews fell under direct Nazi occupation or countries that collaborated with the Nazis, Romania, Hungary, Croatia. About 7 million fell directly under their control. Of the 7 million, it's estimated close to 6 million were murdered when the war was over. And I'm stressing that because we have to understand that that kind of killing ratio did not exist for any other country, ethnic, or religious group. And many people persecuted for all kinds of reasons during World War II, the Cynthia Roma, Germans who were disabled, eh, homosexuals, all kinds of people were persecuted. But nobody 
was slated for total and systematic destruction to the last man, woman, and child besides the Jews. Let's see the next one. I want you to see this video. It's not a very long one. Before I put it on, the 8th of May, 1945, if you're Russian, it's the 9th of May. I'm not going to go into it right now. It's not that important. But what did Victory Day look like in Europe for the, for the Allied forces and the soldiers that participated, and civilians as well in the different countries where uh, the hostilias, hostilias ceased? So let's look at this video. It's in our museum at Yad Vashem, and try and feel and take in uh, the pictures and the feeling of elation and joy. Okay, you right. Okay, this very short excerpt is actually presented in our historical museum at Yad Vashem. You see here the parades, the Red Square in Moscow, Paris, New York, the American and Soviet forces meeting on the Elba. The tremendous joy and relief. Six long years of war. The first of September 1939 to the 8th of May 1945 are finally over. People, the GIs, the Brits, the Soviets, Soviet soldiers can all go home. And they had places to go home to, most did. Soviet Union, it was problematic because of the destruction, but most people had places to go home, reunite with their families and continue with their lives that were interrupted by World War II. Keep those pictures in mind because the next video, very short video, I'm about to show you is what the Jews experienced at the end of World War II. This is also a piece of film that was taken from our historical museum when the British, Bergen-Belsen, Americans, Dachau and Buchenwald encountered the remnants that survived uh, the years of war. Let's look at this. There's no sound. But this is the actual footage that was taken by the Allies when 
they found these camps. I can't say they were liberated. They found the camps. They weren't even on their military maps. They found them usually by way of smell, stumbled on these places and encountered this mass of humanity, which for many of the allied soldiers, British and Americans, this was one of the most traumatizing events of everything they experienced during the war, seeing and meeting these people. When you see those photographs, those are the pictures that the Allied soldiers encountered. And I'm bringing you a very short, powerful testimony. Alan Moskin, who was a liberator, he's also Jewish, and his personal encounter with these survivors of this horrific period. Let's listen to Alan Musk and, and his encounter with them. Uh, I remember when I was outside seeing this elderly gentleman come up to me. And he went down on the ground and then he started to kiss my boots. My boots were filled with blood and feces and mud. And I knew he meant well. He was trying to be affectionate to me. He was saying, Danka, and he was kissing my boots, but it made me very uncomfortable. And I remember picking him up under the armpits and bringing him up toward me. And as I did, as his head came up, I looked at the back of the nape of his neck and down his back. And oh my God, there were these open, pussy, festering sores. And out of the sores, the lice, they all had lice because uh, the camps were filthy. So they, the lice were crawling out of these sores. It's, uh, and it smelled out. And God, I don't know how God gave me the strength not to back off. He smelled from high heaven. But I, I somehow, I, I had the strength to hold my ground, and he came up, and I embraced him, and he started to kiss me and say, Danka, Danka, Americana, Yuda, American, Jew, Yuda, Yuda, Americana. And he was crying, and then I started to cry, and uh, there was a lot of crying going on, and I'm not embarrassed to tell you, this was very emotional. I'm going to stop here for a moment and go back and retract. We saw the joy, the elation of the Allied forces with the unconditional surrender of Germany in May 1945. We saw the pictures of the survivors that had survived this horrific uh, period of history. We hear the liberator. And essentially, the survivors were asking themselves, why, Mitch, why just me? The guilt that these survivors held Maybe I did something wrong. Where do I go from here? What do I do with my life? When for most of these people, they're the only surviving remnants from their family. And here, in continuing this presentation, we're gonna meet different survivors. These are people that come and give personal testimonies in our educational seminars at Yad Vashem, that I'm responsible for in the school. And each one has a very different story where and when they were liberated, but they have one common denominator. That all of them, and I'm making a general statement here with survivors in general, decided to pick up their lives and to take the loss, the pain, the grief, and to do something positive and to go forward. Let's see the next slide. And you see here when the war is over, it's estimated the number of displaced persons, Jews that were displaced that weren't willing to go home and were in displaced persons camps, DP camps, it numbered about 300,000. 
Now, if you're asking me, of those 300,000, how many survived camps? The numbers vary anywhere between 60 to 80,000 that actually survived different camps. There were those that came out of hiding. They were living on false identities. That had been saved by righteous among the nations. But these displaced persons didn't go home. Many survivors, many survivors, when the war was over, did try and go home. But their coming home wasn't what you saw with the soldiers and their coming home to their respective countries. When they came home and knocked on the door of where they were living, in many countries, they were lucky if they walked away with their lives intact. We know today thousands of Jews were murdered in Poland by Polish anti-Semites after the Holocaust, after the Holocaust. Hungary, Romania, Poland, there were countries where, like in Denmark, where Jews returned, that the Danish non-Jews had protected their property and gave it back to them. But in most places, this was not a very comfortable homecoming. And therefore, they turned back to the West and remained in those DP camps, waiting to try and get out of uh, Europe and to immigrate. Let's see the next, the next slide. These are approximate numbers. About 60% decided to come to the uh, land of Israel, the state of Israel in 1948, which in 1948 opens its doors completely. United States, about 100,000. Australia, I, I put that up there on purpose uh, because interesting enough, Australia opened their doors in a very interesting immigration policy where they realized they don't have enough population during World War II, they need more people. So they open up their doors and essentially Australia has probably one of the highest ratios of a Holocaust survivor population among the 120,000 Jews that live in Australia. A, originally about 27,000 came there after the war. The next one. Liberated but not free. That's a direct quote, again, taken from our historical museum. They're liberated. Okay, but where do you go? When you say, but not free, what do you do with that liberate? What do you do with the freedom? Where do we go and what do we do? Are the two major questions that survivors had to encounter uh, when this is over and decide how to continue their lives. I'm gonna show you this video. This is a survivor, Frida Klinger, and she has a very moving story. Born in Warsaw, was in the Warsaw Ghetto, 1943, was there during the revolt. As a result of the revolt, she was, her and her sister were taken, sent to Majdanek death camp, from there to Auschwitz, Ravensbrück, and she ended up in Bergen-Belsen, where she was liberated on the 15th of April, 1945, by the British Army. Frida, like many other survivors, she had one of the first Jewish weddings in Bergen-Belsen. By the way, she's 99 years old. I and my wife, both of us try and stay in touch with Frida. Uh, she's totally lucid. She doesn't walk a lot. Uh, but we have invited her in the past to our educational seminars. Let's listen to what she tells us about her wedding in December 18, 1945. Uh, so one uh, afternoon, uh, there was a table, a long table, about five, six men came to have company, my company, they want everybody want to be A Roma came in. He looked not from uh, Auschwitz, not from, uh, uh, he was then already 30, 31 years old, but he looked, he was handsome, very handsome. And with this, with a suit, not an uh, outfit of passion. Uh, okay, so since then uh, we, he was a part of this whole crowd. 
uh, but uh, he wasn't bashful. He didn't take too long, and he right away told me openly, so that he would like like to marry me. And it was uh, the day of the wedding. Um, and Franja is crying and crying. I didn't have even a prom dress to, to put on uh, to this wedding, but this didn't matter. And everybody was invited. Whoever wants to come, there was no invitations, no, no music. The music, uh, luckily, and one of our friends, Josef Mack, they found the accordion, and uh, he was really, Mr. he was making uh, uh, happy the people. He was uh, playing beautiful on the accordion. His wife was a pianist, but we didn't have a piano. He played Jewish music. And uh, at the wedding, <laughs> Uh, they were in the ra two rabbis married us off. Raf Helfgott, who was the English army Raf, and a Raf who I got his name. He was a, oh, a survivor. So, you see, I brought you once the ktuba. You saw the ktuba, very original. This is the original ktuba. From many Rindos. many people saw already the. A very original club, but with two rabbis, uh, with uh, two witnesses. He, uh, when, uh, when he, when I met him, and he asked me to marry. So I saw his eyes, beautiful eyes, but very sad. And inside me, I said, I got it. I, I didn't answer right away. Uh, you know the story. This and that. But I decided to bring life to his eyes. This was very important to me, and I did. Frida is unique, extraordinary, but I can say that many survivors, she represents what many survivors trying to connect, even reconnect. <laughs> finding people that were born in the same country, sometimes the same city. There were also survivors. Romick, after meeting Frida for the first, after the first week, he proposed to her. She played hard to get, uh, according to Frida. And her wedding, no pictures, don't have anything, does have the, uh, the ketubah that you actually saw there, but the 18th, 18 is a very important number. And it's easy to remember on the 18th of December, this is only six months after she's liberated to come together, to get married, to have children. I want you all to know that in Bergen-Belsen in 1946, a year after it was organized as a DP camp, they celebrated the thousandth Jewish wedding. People wanted to connect and they wanted to have children. And essentially, this was their revenge, having children. Let's go on to the next one. It has a very, very different story. Uh, before we listen to her, this is Yehudi Kleinman. She's originally from Italy. And very shortly, she was only five years old when she was called uh, in Milan to the office of the Gestapo with her mother and grandmother and forced to choose who she wants to go with, mother, her grandmother, a Christian neighbor. Her mother made it very clear she should go with a Christian neighbor just by looking at her. The mother and grandmother were taken away. Christian neighbor took her, couldn't really take care of her, took her to a monastery to a convent, and they took her in and protected her. And when the war is over, 
two people come to the convent, they were looking for Jewish children, Tzvika and Leah from the Jewish agency that came from the, uh, the uh, land of Israel here to look for Jewish children. She thought when she was called down, when these two people came that her parents arrived. She was surprised to see two people she doesn't know. And they want to take her out of the convent and take her to the land of Israel. And the superior mother, whom she loved, she had to decide, six-year-old girl, what is she going to do? To go with Tzvika and Leah that she doesn't know, but to stay in the convent where she had been for the last year and has friends and people that love her. What do you do? What do you do? And where does she go? Let's listen to her testimony. I told you that she won't go with you. And they said, uh, you did. Uh, you are not a Christian, so you have to be and uh, live with the uh, people that uh, that you belong to. And uh, Mother Superior said, uh, Dita, you are very dear to me. I don't want you to go. Jesus saved you. Under his protection, you are safe. And Leah said, uh, she doesn't belong to you. She was only put in your custody. And Leah came to me and she kneeled down and looked me straight in the eyes and said, uh, you did, you're seven years old, you're a big girl already. So you have to understand, here in the convent, you found a temporary uh, shelter. Now that the war is over, we are going to all the convents and taking out all the Jewish children and bringing them to Eretz Israel. Your place is, is not here in Italy, it's there in Eretz Israel. Mother Superior said to me, Dita, you have to make a very difficult decision. Go to the little room and think over where you want to be. After half an hour, we will call you and you will tell us what you have decided. I went upstairs and I was very confused. I didn't know what to do. On the one hand, I was used to being in, uh, in the convent. I, I was there a year and a half already. I had four girls that were good friends of mine. I had two nuns that liked me and Mother Superior that loved me. And then I said to myself, Leah said that all, all the Jews are going now to, to Eretz Israel. That means that my mother and grandmother are also there. Yes, I will go with them. Essentially, this seven-year-old had to make choices that I don't think any of us that have children, grandchildren, would expect them to make similar decisions. What do you do? What really was the defining factor is that she said to herself as a seven-year-old, Tzvika and Leah are telling me that this is where all the Jews live. And maybe my mother and father are there because that's where all the Jews are. And in that very naive way, she based her decision to leave the convent, say goodbye to her friends, to Mother Superior. And she was sent to Northern Italy. And there, a, about six months later, put on a boat a, that brought her to Eretz Yisrael in 1946. Let's see another example. Before we do this, and I know you probably have all seen Schindler's List, I want you to see another liberation scene. We've seen Bergen-Belsen, we've seen Yudit in the convent, the war ended there, people trying to look for her. And this is another liberation scene uh, that all the survivors remember, and we all remember it from Schindler's List. Uh, all the survivors that were in Schindler's List remember this very dramatic, scene where this Russian soldier on a white horse comes into the camp, you've been liberated by the Soviet army. That was the moment of liberation. But where do you go? They need food, 
they go to a, a village that's not far away to procure for themselves food, but where did they go? Essentially, most of these survivors got on trains to take them back to Krakow, where they had businesses, they originated from Krakow, and from there, some stayed, some left, but their first inclination was to go back to Krakow to see who had survived. And I wanna introduce you to uh, two survivors. They have a very special story, which I'll give you a synopsis of. Nahum and Genya Menor that live in Be'er Sheva. Uh, he's 96, she's 93. And let's listen just a piece of those moments of liberation that she recounts to us. That she and I, Schindler, אסב את כולנו בתוך האולם, אולם של המפעל, ואמר, גרמניה הפסידה במלחמה, אתם אנשים חופשים, אתם חוזרים הביתה. ואמר, אני מוכרח לברוח, אני משאיר אתכם, ותתחילו ותש... את החיים שלכם בתור בני אדם חופשיים. והוא באמת עזב אותנו ואנחנו נסענו לפולין. הנסיקה הראשונה שקיבלתי מנחו זה היה ביום הולדת שלי, 1945, שנגמרה המלחמה, היינו בבריניץ שנינו, עלינו, היה שם יער קטן על, על הגבעה, עלינו על הגבעה, ושם בפעם ראשונה הוא כיבג אותי ונתן לי נשיקה. still remembers her first kiss with Nahum. Never argue with a woman's memory. I'm warning you all. That for her was a defining moment. And there's a backstory to this. Nahum and Genya were both in the Emile factory working there in Oscar Schindler's factory. He was 22, she was 17, 18 years old. And they met there and they fell in love. And Nahum said to her, if we survive the war, I wanna marry you in a small town outside of Tel Aviv called Givatayim. Why there of all places? Nahum's family, a fascinating story, it was a very Zionist family in the 1920s, they came on the fourth Zionist wave of immigration to the land of Israel. And they settled in a small town outside of Tel Aviv called Givatayim where they built a home. 1931, 32, the economic depression affected the British mandate of Palestine here in this country. And Nahum's father decided to take his wife and three children back to Krakow. Very few Jews did that. If you reached safe shores, you stayed there. But he had to support his family. His father, his mother, brother and sister were all murdered in death camp Belzitz in 1942. He was a car mechanic and employed in Schindler's factory. Genya was working on the lathes that produced the pots and pans. The war is over. They all go back to Krakow. Nahum looked for his family, couldn't find anyone. Genya's mother and brother were both saved by Oscar Schindler and she stayed in Krakow. He left, went to Italy, got in one of the boats that took him to the land of Israel, joined the Jewish underground, the Palyam, 
became a wireless operator on illegal ships that brought Jews to the land of Israel between 1945 and 48. They didn't see each other for four years. They wrote love letters that, by the way, they've translated from Polish into Hebrew for their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Genya finally makes it to the, not the land of Israel, but to the state of Israel in December 1949 and January 17, 1950, Nahum and Genya were married in Yibatayim, as he promised her during the war. Just to end this story, on January 17th, the year 2000, on their 50th wedding anniversary, they've now been married 70 years this year, we celebrated with them. But on the 50th wedding anniversary, Nahum and Genya decided to celebrate that wedding anniversary in the most significant place for them personally, a Catholic cemetery on Mount Zion. Why there? Oscar Schindler passed away in October 1974 and stipulated in his will that he wants, if he doesn't survive the operation, he wants to be buried among his friends in Israel, where he's laid to rest. On that day, we actually had an educational seminar. We went up to Schindler's grave, Nahum and Genya, a bottle of whiskey to make a lachaim, and they brought their son, their daughter, and their four yingle, their four grandchildren. It was probably the most moving scene to see a person, Oscar Schindler, who didn't save just 1,200 Jews. He saved countless future generations. And that verse from the Talmud, one who saves a single life, is if he saved an entire world, was a reality on January 17, 2000 for all of us. The next one. Just I have some pictures here I wanted to show you. No, next one. This is Nahum and Genya. The next one. A, this is Genya's hand embracing Nahum. But look to the extreme right, that first ring she has in her hand, sort of a square ring made out of nickel. Nahum fashioned that ring for Genya on her 18th birthday, engraving the initials GW, Genya Wolfheiler, and gave it to her as an act of love for her birthday at 18 years old. She has not taken off that ring since. Even when the woman was sent to Auschwitz and she was beaten, she refused to take off the ring. And she has kept that that connects them for all eternity. The next one. This is the only picture that they actually have a day after the wedding which was January 17th, they're here in Kibbutz Megiddo. Uh, that's the day after the wedding, that's the only picture. I did a little research with them in their home, going through all their pictures. And the next one, this is a beautiful picture that I took from Nahum and Genya. It's their granddaughter and their great grandson. About four years ago, Nahum sends me an email. He's in his 90s. I love this guy. Sends an email. If I'm, I deserve a Mazal Tov. Our first great grandson was just born. I immediately wrote back to him, Mazal Tov, did you tell Oscar Schindler? I got an immediate reply, he was the first to know. This was Oscar Schindler for this couple. The next one. Can okay, I take you now to somebody else? And we're going to finish here with. Uh, this survivor, uh, this is Tibiram, Hungary, Slovakia, where he was born, uh, was sent with his family uh, to Auschwitz, where both his father and brother uh, survived. They were death march uh, on to Bergen-Belsen. Uh, his father passes away a few days before liberation. His brother passes away after liberation. But this is a 15 year old that is liberated at Bergen Belsen. And let's hear a piece of his story.
ברגנבל זה, זה היה המקום שאם יש גיהנום, זה המקום. אבא שוכב מצב חמור מאוד, וכשאני מבחין שאבא כבר לא נושם יותר, לוקח את האח שלי, מתחיל ללכת איתו, כי מכיוון מסוים באים אנשים, והם אומרים שהאנגלים הגיעו ואנחנו חופשים. בדרך אנחנו פוגשים שתי בנות מהשכבה של האח שלי, הן מזהות אותנו ואומרות, אמא שלכם פה. בדיוק שנה אחרי שהופרדנו מאמא, הם מביאים לנו את אמא. אני מאוד שמחתי שפגשתי את אמא, אבל אני חשבתי האם היא שמחה כשאנחנו מודיעים לה שאבא מת והיא רואה שהבן הגדול שלה הולך למות וגם הקטן הוא לא מי יודע מה הגיבור אז אני לא יודע אם היא כל כך שמחה זאת הייתה פגישה עצובה מכניסים אותי לבית חולים, אולם גדול, שתי שורות של מיטות, אני בשורה אחת, האח שלי שורה לפניי. אני נרדם, אני מתעורר אחרי לא יודע כמה זמן, אני רואה שהמיטה שלו, של אח שלי ריקה. אני יורד, מדדה, שואל, מי רע, אף אחד, כולם מוזלמנים, כולם חסים איתי, אף אחד לא יודע שום דבר, עד שניגש אל האחד. דווקא לבוש יפה, נראה טוב, מילד בו איתי, מכניס אותי למשרד שלו, הוא מציג את עצמו, הוא רופא יהודי פולני, הוא אומר לי, תשמע, האח שלך לא החזיק מעמד והוא מת הבוקר. והוא פורז בבכי. אני כלום, אין רגשות. אני אומר לו, תודה רבה, ואני הולך, כי אני צריך לחפש את אמא. מסתובב במחנה, לא מצליח להשיג שום מידע על אמא. זאת הייתה הפעם האחרונה שראיתי את אימא. טיבי finds himself all alone in ביגן בלזן. And again, the question remains, where do you go and what do you do? We first met Tibi about 15 years ago and began inviting him to our educational seminars. He lives on a kibbutz, Kibbutz Afikim, uh, just south of the Sea of Galilee. And all I had to do was make a, a telephone call, Tibi, we need you. He'll come by bicycle, he'll walk, he'll come by cab. To come to Yad Vashem, he sees it as his supreme mission to come and to relate his story to soldiers, to teachers, to young men and women eh, that come to Yad Vashem. His friends on the kibbutz would say to him, Tibi, why are you going to Yad Vashem? It's a place of death. What are you finding there? Why do you keep going once a week, twice a week? By the way, he also goes on IDF missions to Poland. And Tibi would say to them, when I walk into Yad Vashem, and I go through that, that gate. It's a machaya. It fills me with life. What are you talking about? I see soldiers. I see young men and women. I see teachers. It fills me with life. That is Yad Vashem and what we do for Tibi Ram. There's one more part we're going to see with Tibi. Uh, Tibi learned something from his father. That you have a homeland and you have to defend that homeland. And Tibi 
comes to, the, to Israel, goes to a kibbutz, joins the military, and from 1948 to 2006, Tibi served in every conflict that Israel has experienced during those years. He actually received a special citation from the President of the State of Israel for his service to the IDF and to the State of Israel. This is what he decided to do with his life. Let's hear the last part. מאוד אהבתי את הבת הגדולה שלי, אחר כך את הבן, את הבת הקטנה. אבל מה שמעניין, בכל הלידות אני הייתי במילואים. אף פעם לא הייתי נוכח בלידות. אני השתתפתי בכל מלחמות ישראל, ותמיד ביחידות שדה, ביחידות חי"ר, חוץ מצוק איתן. הייתי כבר בן שמונים ומשהו. כבר התביישתי לבקש, כי ידעו שלא ייתנו לי. אני 35 שנה לא דיברתי, האמת היא גם לא חשבתי על השואה, אבל לא הזכרתי את השואה. אני אף פעם לא חשבתי חזרה, מה עם אבא שלי, מה עם אמא שלי. אני חשבתי רק על קדימה, קדימה. אני תמיד חושב קדימה. פעם לא רציתי להיות יהודי, והיום חשובה לי המשכיות העם היהודי. בשבילי חשובה כברת ארץ שהיא שלי, של היהודים. אבא שלי אמר לי שהדבר הכי חשוב שיש לבן אדם זה מולדת. ועל המולדת צריך לשמור. I hope that uh, what I've showed you this evening and the interaction and the stories we heard, the personal stories we heard from survivors has been both enriching and inspiring. They are truly representative of Holocaust survivors, not just in Israel, in the United States, Australia, and throughout the world, that for the most part, not everyone, decided to pick up, to go on, to have children, to have grandchildren, and to lead creative and fruitful lives. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any questions. First of all, I would like to say that it was extremely moving. I've been in Yad Vashem for the past year, that you've touched me deeply with these uh, lecture. Do we know how many fell along the way, not those who actually managed to come up from the ashes and the dust and build themselves back again? Do we have any estimate of those who did not? Hey, Jeremy, I don't have figures, but I can tell you something from my last 51 years living in Israel. I can still remember the Hebrew University as a student there, going to the, uh, the central library there in Givat Ram. This is the 1970s. And there was a Holocaust survivor that worked there. He was disorientated. He worked there, but it was very clear that he was one of the ones that was unsuccessful at coming back. During my last 32 years at Yad Vashem, I've met more than 450 Holocaust survivors. These are people we invited to educational seminars to give them training to tell their stories in front of groups. There have been very few people that I've met from among, among that group that I can say were people that fell by the way. So there's another story still in my, my memory bank of a young woman who is a five or six year old was living on the streets by herself in Poland, going from place to place. She had no one. A person that when she heard stories of other survivors during this five-day seminar, she envied the survivors that were in camps. 
because they had somebody. She was all alone, never married, never had any children. So not everybody could make that leap. But I think the miraculous story that we have to take in consideration is the fact that so many did after everything they suffered. And I'll probably, let me end with this, that I said the revenge of Holocaust survivors was getting married and having children. But over the years I've seen at Yad Vashem, it wasn't just having children. It was having Yingala, grandchildren. When survivors had grandchildren, many times they didn't tell their personal stories to their own children. They wanted to be normal. Although sometimes these kids, they were growing up in Holocaust survivor families, would hear their parents yelling and screaming in the middle of the night in languages they didn't understand. They knew there was something that they were traumatized by. When the grandchildren came, and they came to the Bobby and the Zaidi, what's that number on your arm? They were more than willing. Not all of them, but they, many were willing to tell their grandchildren what they experienced. And for the first time, the grandchildren, they had grandparents. The children, Holocaust survivor families, grew up without any grandparents, aunts and uncles, extended family. So the real, real revenge of Holocaust survivors was having grandchildren. And I've seen it time and again in my meetings with survivors, how significant that has been. Well, ladies and gentlemen, all I can wish you is a good Shabbos and long life and mucho health for all of us and your families and, ex and friends. Be well. Shalom. Belihitot.